Hello, I'm Dr. Stacey Hope, the consultant for the UNDP and the Guyana Shield Facility on the study of Suriname. As we continue the conversation on gender and biodiversity within the Guyana Shield, this presentation will cover Suriname's national approaches to gender and biodiversity, the identification of critical drivers and pressures likely to shape the Guyana Shield Facility's engagement with different actors in the process of designing gender sensitive systems. And finally, recommendations to the International Society of Biodiversity within the Guyana Shield. The information in this presentation has been informed by field work I conducted in August of 2012 with members of the government, local NGOs, academic institutions, and international organizations. It also draws from semi-structured interviews and participant observation with local indigenous and marginalized groups. So this includes the Maroons, specifically the Saramakan and Aukans of Brokopondo district, as well as uh, Abadukondre and Upper Suriname River, as well as the Amerindians of Pawaka and Pierre Condre. All the participants had deep-rooted connections with the biodiversity in the region, specifically as it pertains to gender relations. As environmental discourse becomes increasingly linked to human development, the incorporation of knowledge, perceptions, and practices through gendered dimensions are integral to their sustainable development. In particular, when we look at divisions of labor and activities through gender, we're left with a substantial amount of differences between the roles men and women fulfill in society and the uses of biological diversity within it. However, gender disaggregated roles and knowledge have been somewhat ignored in a broader scope of things. Therefore, it is imperative that awareness is raised and action is taken in mainstreaming of gender-based knowledge within biodiversity conservation. Biological diversity within the Guyana Shield region is closely linked to livelihoods, cultures, and traditions of the most vulnerable and marginalized peoples. With the region spanning 2.5 million square kilometers, it houses 10 to 15 percent of the world's fresh water and has the world's highest percentage of tropical rainforests, of which 80 to 90 percent is still intact. However, at present, there are immediate anthropogenic and natural threats facing the ecological integrity of the Guyana Shield, such as deforestation, climate change, natural disasters, most recently the May 2006 floods, legal and illegal mining, water pollution, poaching of wildlife, poverty, and weak institutional capacity. As a result, it is important to turn to those national stakeholders who are addressing biodiversity and the pressures placed on them. This is key for the Guyana Shield facility, as it is here we can establish the key players within this discourse. So what does this mean? It is clear that within the Surinamese context, as it is through the rest of the region, that national level efforts to improve the strategic orientation of biological diversity conservation must be strengthened. What is even more evident is that with gender mainstreaming being taken into consideration, the Guyana Shield facility can provide quality backstopping strategies. Now, the government has made commitments to several international frameworks towards biodiversity. These commitments are meant to develop and execute various policy measures for the sustainable conservation of biodiversity in the region. The national vision was culminated from a series of mandates with one of the more significant ones being the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. In order to manage these needs, pressures, and entities, Suriname has established a national biodiversity strategy. This strategy focuses on, quote, the national vision, goals, and strategic directions to be pursued in order to conserve and sustainably use the nation's rich biodiversity and biological resources and foster the sustainable management of its natural resources and support the equitable sharing 
of the biodiversity related to services and benefits provided by the ecosystems, end quote. At the regional and national levels, Suriname commits to gender mainstreaming vis-a-vis -vis the support of various programs of the OAS, CARICOM, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America. Currently, there are three arms to the government which deal specifically with gender. These are the National Bureau of Gender Policy, the Ministry of Domestic Affairs, and the Integral Gender Action Plan. The Ministry of Domestic Affairs leads the government in developing, implementing, and communicating on the national gender policy, whereas the Integral Gender Action Plan appeals to the Beijing Platform for Action 1995 Strategic Goal H.2, which advocated for the integration of gender perspective in jurisdiction, programs, policies, and projects. This is an action plan which resonates with the National Bureau of Gender Policy and outlines to the Surinamese government how to execute activities within the framework of the gender policy. As we reflect on current national practices, at present, the gender plan of action has not yet been adopted in practice, which presents serious implications for national and local level stakeholders. However, as the contents of the development plan, which has a gender focus, have yet to be released, it is difficult to comment on policies that are in the process of changing. Therefore, as a strong recommendation, it is encouraged that a revision of this document be considered after the release and implementation of the development plan. However, there are a few good practices directed towards gender mainstreaming. At the policy level, Suriname has ratified two gender-related treaties to date, the first being the CEDAW Treaty of 1979, which was signed by Suriname in 1993, and the second being the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention, Eradication, and Punishment of Violence Against Women. At the program level, NGOs such as National Women's Movement and Stichting Man Mit Man and the Platform for NGOs for Women, Gender and Development play a central role in data collection and the execution of programs aimed at promoting gender equality. The emergence of the National Bureau on Gender Policy is also good implementation as it operates as a gender management system in order to assist the various gender focal points within the ministries. Finally, at the project level, there are several good practices, such as the national women's movements work on economic empowerment activities that take a localized woman-based approach, but use it in a way to promote gender equity, such as water filtration, which allows for equal access to clean water and the making of non-timber forest products to go towards the development of the communities. However, as Seals explained, it is difficult to put forth a case for gender mainstreaming within projects due to the lack of gender experts in the country, as well as the lack of training on gender-based approaches. So how can the Guyana Shield Facility initiatives in Suriname benefit from this information? The strengthening of the institutional framework for gender mainstreaming by having a focal point to support developing, implementing, and monitoring is key to traditional conservation practices. Therefore, there is a need to identify and work on specific thematic issues with strong gender dimensions, such as sustainable forest management, indigenous peoples, and climate change adaptation. Hence, this presentation ends with key action points for mainstreaming gender within biodiversity conservation and management, which projects may benefit from when dealing with indigenous and maroon communities in Suriname and the Guyana Shield region as a whole. These action points emanated from discussions with key informants from international organizations to local CBOs. But most importantly, these come from 
the consultations with the Maroons and Amerindians, who are the main focus of this study. In Suriname, there has been no documentation of the differential knowledge between men and women as it pertains to biodiversity resources. This, however, is with the exception of Conservation International, which has already conducted a mapping project using gender disaggregated knowledge, which our own chair for the panel has overseen. Yet this data has yet to be analyzed vis-a-vis -vis a gender lens. Although men and women share knowledge about the environment, they also have different knowledge sets and systems in which they exist. Therefore, by noting the difference in knowledge and types of knowledge, it would be more efficient for agencies working on conservation initiatives to take this information into consideration and incorporate that within their own practices. It was also evident that the government and international agencies needed to acknowledge the role of women and men in the management of ecosystems. This goes hand in hand with the need to utilize and promote traditional knowledge in the management of local level resources, which we see in Pikinsle amongst the Saramakan and in Pawaka amongst the women who show knowledge on traditional plants and medicinal herbs. It is necessary to increase both Amerindian and Maroon roles in decision making as it pertains to biodiversity and conservation. However, it is even more important to do this through gender divisions as well. That is, men and women of both indigenous and marginalized groups need to be involved in these processes through access or increased access to information and equitable participation. Even more astonishing was the talk about climate change, especially amongst the Saramakan men of Pikinsle and the women of Pawaka and Pierre Condre. As both noted changes to animal migration and harvesting. Therefore, this action plan speaks to the need for men's and women's adaptation to flora and fauna management to be recognized and considered. Finally, it must be a priority to develop clear guidelines, tools, and methodologies to mainstream gender into biodiversity conservation and management. Once gender has been systematically integrated into biodiversity research and policies, then we can identify gender gaps and inequalities. As the Guyana Shield, an ecoregion of global significance, becomes increasingly threatened by past and present pressures put onto the environment by agents such as the extractive industries, intensified agriculture, and misappropriation of land. Those who become most affected are the people who understand the environment the most. In addition, due to a lack of institutional capacity within the region, efforts to combat these ecological problems have been unsustainable. As this presentation has identified, there needs to be both male and female contributions. However, it is with the women that I have witnessed the most activity as it pertains to plant life and water resources. And with the men, that wildlife management was integral. However, women are still considered the more marginalized of the two genders. And as a result, it is necessary to conclude by offering some final recommendations. We need to prioritize the conservation of plant resources that are of the greatest importance to women, whilst attempting to reverse their degradation, such as changing culinary habits and the pressures on women's time and land resources. We also need to acknowledge and document the value of indigenous technical knowledge of biodiversity possessed by men and women, recognize indigenous rights systems to plants and the fact that these rights systems are differentiated by sex, guarantee indigenous women's full participation and decision-making capacity in conservation and management efforts and policies that affect them, and monitoring such efforts for their effects on these women's rights, status, and welfare. And finally, we need to promote the dissemination of research on women's knowledge of ecosystem, 
which is lacking within the region. At the same time, the Amerindian and Maroon peoples who live within the area of study have not had their rights systematically addressed within the context of land, biodiversity, and lack of public services and attention. Therefore, by way of concluding this presentation, it is with this lack of attention that brings a lack of recognition to their traditional knowledge, a knowledge that will best equip the Guyana Shield facility to manage the environment sustainably. Danke well and thank you.